wait, wait, let me let me explain something to you. Um, I am not Mr. Lebowski. I'm the dude. You know, uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. Are you employed, Mr. Lebowski? Ah! Employed? You like sex, Mr. Lebowski. Is this your only ID? You got the wrong guy. I'm the dude. Your name's Lebowski, Lebowski. <laughs> Jeff Lebowski, the other Lebowski, the millionaire. I received this ransom note this morning. This is a bummer, man. They want you to take the money and act as courier. What the hell is this? My dirty undies, dude. The whites. Let's take that hill! Why should we settle for 20 grand when we can keep the entire million? I know you're mixed up in all this. Playing one side against the other in bed with everybody. Blow them. Huh? Fabulous stuff. What? Who's sitting on a million dollars? We want some money. Ah! Sitting in the trunk of our car. Where is my damn money? Say, dude, where is your car? Who's got your undies, Walter? This is a very complicated case, Maude. You know, a lot of ins, a lot of outs. Is this your homework, Larry? And I would like my undies back. A lot of, uh strands to keep in my head, man. Whoa! Hey, careful, man! There's a beverage here, huh? I like your style, dude. I have no choice but to tell these bums to do whatever is necessary to recover their money from you. They were Nazis, dude? They were nihilists, man. They kept saying they believed in nothing. You know, uh, a deadbeat. Well, aren't you? Well, yeah. You cannot drag this negative energy into the tournament. Jeffrey. Bond? Love me. Uh, that's my robe. I'm throwing rocks tonight. It don't matter to Jesus. <laughs> this could be a, a, a lot more a, a, a complex. I mean, it's not just, it might not be just such a simple uh, you know? It's more official that way. Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... Uh, you can call me the Pope, or El Poperino, or Mr. Pope, can if, you're not, if, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. Can we call you Mr. Johnson? No, no. <laughs> um... My name is Reverend Steve, and I'm the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which I founded in 96, and um, is still going, I was going to say is still going strong, but it's, it, it, it still, it, it still exists, so it's not going strong, it's going slowly, like a turtle. It's going like a turtle. Well, we, you know, that's, that's what happens when we don't do door knocking. Yeah. You know, that, that'll yeah. happen. Yeah. Oh, my uh, my wife and I are about to celebrate our 10th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, we our anniversary is on Cinco de Mayo, which we did on purpose to um, to to take away that holiday. 
to take away that holiday. Yeah. We said, how, how about we get married on blank? And I said, wait, Cinco de Mayo. Okay, well, number one, it, I'm bad at remembering things. Yeah. I can definitely remember a wedding anniversary if it's on Cinco de Mayo, number one. Yes. Number two, um, I'm not officially a Mexican. I'm like a like a half Mexican. I'm a Mexican. Uh-huh. So it's nice to get this uh, this Mexican holiday and just retrofit it for me. <laughs> you know, I like that. And as it happens in Oklahoma City, uh, Primus is doing a concert uh, the night of our wedding anniversary. So nice. my, wife, my wife and I are going to see Primus. They will be doing the Primus and the Chocolate Factory album in its entirety, which I'm really excited about because I mentioned that on a podcast. Yes, maybe- a while back. Yes, quite a while back. So it's, you know, thought I'd mention it. I'm pretty excited to see them. This would be like the second time I've seen Primus, and it should be fun. Yes. I have about a million things to give to my wife for her anniversary. Good. Because I have become one of those people who buys presents throughout the year. You know, one of those people, Uh huh. one of those people, I used to be a last second here. Let me just grab something. But now it's just one of those things where if I'll see something, I'll go, oh, that'll be good for Emerald. Oh, but Emerald, her birthday is not for six months. OK, I'll just hold it for her. Yeah. Last Christmas, I gave her something and she was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you got me this. Thank you. Wait a second. There's a date of delivery on this bag. You got this in May? I gave it to her for Christmas. You got this in May? (laughs) I'm so pissed. Like, how could you? She was super upset. (laughs) She'll be really upset when she finds out I'm doing this. Uh, I'm doing this podcast in her room, but hopefully she will not find that out. Oh, she's really upset at me that I watched uh, God's not dead on her Netflix account. <laughs> She's super upset. She randomly hits me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an abused, abused father. She said the other day she went to go watch, uh, unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And it said, why don't you watch Esther? <laughs> So she's yeah. really upset at me. Yeah, I keep getting offered offered Barney and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's pretty wonderful. <laughs> it's a as far as pranks go, I think that that's pretty amazing. My wife, though, my wife is one of those people that's absolutely horrible at giving gifts. She just she knows me probably better than anyone else out there. We've been dating for about 12 years, but God, she can't get a gift to save her life. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's Christmas. And so she's like, honey, tell me what you want. Make me a list. Tell me what you like. What should I get you? And, uh, okay. I'll make a list of things. You still have to address it to Santa though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have some uh, DVDs of Bob's Dirty Shorts. It's a two DVD set, has six okay. episodes, runs a bit better than three hours. Awesome. And I want to run this by you, but I heard okay. on the radio an awesome contest idea. But this okay. will really be a lot more up your alley than mine. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. And it is called Song or Porn, where you would get a musical clip from someplace, and the people entering the contest would need to guess, is that like an actual song, or is it a clip from a porno movie? Okay. All right. You know, because, like, really, the opening of Shaft is pretty on the porno side. 
Yeah. You know, that's kind of the idea there. All right. <laughs> All right. I, I figured this was like two great things that you love, music and porn. Yes, that is true. That is quite true. <laughs> it's like a that's... Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Two great things that taste great together. Yes. So, homework this week. Fell through. Fell through. Yes. It fell through. Wah, 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 need, to, need to think of some good homework for next week, but I can't, can't really think of anything. I thought of maybe uh, a video. It, it, it's just a quick little video and have people find it and watch it. The only problem is, is that I already had the video on the playlist for baffled. Yes. So I feel like making it homework doesn't fully count because it's technically kind of sort of already something that has been a part yes. of the show, but I still think that I might do that anyway. So I really like when we do the homework, you know? Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's an appetizer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have two pretty strange lists for this week's movie. I had a hard time with this week's movie. Yeah. I had a hard time with this week's movie because I, for the first time ever, and it's weird because we've done some pretty big movies. We've watched some movies that are fairly popular. I mean, we did a Guardians of the Galaxy episode, for Christ's sake. Yeah, but, but we haven't but, done anything popular in a while. Yeah, I, so when, when it came time to just to just watch The Big Lebowski, okay, I'm watching it, but then when it came time to kind of compile notes and stuff like that, I, I just thought... Is there anything that I could add to this mm -hmm. that hasn't already been picked apart by a billion freaking obs insanely obsessed fans of this movie? Yeah. Because there are some pretty seriously obsessed people out there when it comes to this movie. Oh, yes. There is a, there is a documentary on Netflix. It's probably still there called The Achievers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean to see that. I, I, I guess I have a problem with the Big Lebowski. How so? Well, this problem is a problem that I just have with a lot of, oh, hi, Maxwell. How are you? What's wrong, Maxwell? Here, here, come here. Tell it to the podcast. Tell, it, tell the podcast what's wrong. Say, podcast, there's something wrong. Podcast, there's something wrong. There's something, what's wrong? Tell the podcast. Bella kill me? Bella is not going to kill you, okay? And if Bella does kill you, I will I will revenge your name. Okay? I will go on a Kill Bill-like quest. I will go on a quest to seek vengeance. Vengeance? Yeah. Do you want Daddy to seek vengeance? Yeah. S then, then tell the podcast. Say, podcast, my dad will seek vengeance. <laughs> podcast will be vengeance. That's the, I think you said that we're just going to be Funyuns, but... Oh, he's out. <laughs> we're going to be Funyuns. We're going to be Funyuns. You we're going to be Funyuns, yes. Yeah, we're going to be Funyuns. The problem that I have with The Big Lebowski is, is it, it's less a problem with the movie, but just a problem with myself personally. They, there's just this thing that happens to me where if something becomes really, really popular in culture or society, then most of the times I will consciously avoid said thing. Yes. So most of the things that I've been obsessed with for a while, are they're not things that are sort of a mainstream acceptance. It's, it's just, it's a different, it's a it, it's just something with me. So I, I think this movie has just become too popular mm -hmm. for me, which is weird because I, I, I saw the movie the day it came out opening day at like 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. at night that the Friday it came out, I was there. And maybe I 
I saw it at a, a movie theater that is no longer around uh, by Metro Center Mall in Phoenix, Arizona. And I swear about maybe 20 or 30 other people were in the theater. Yeah. Opening night on a Friday. But oh, they, not a, there, was hard, yeah, there was hardly anybody there. Not a good crowd for an opening night. No, no, not at all. But I, I just found the movie to be so strange and bizarre. And I, I just, like, I, I saw that the movie... Who's out there? You there? You're cutting out. I don't know. Am I there? You are still here, yes. Okay. Oh, well, then, there you go. That was weird. <laughs> um, a... I saw that the movie wasn't doing good when it first came out and I just, I fell in love with it and I held it and I said, oh, I love you movie. It's okay that nobody else loves you. Yes. <laughs> because I love you. I saw you the day it came out, you came out and I've been obsessed with you for a really long time. But then suddenly this movie just became so cool and so commonplace. Yeah. And it's weird that such a strange movie like this could become something so commonplace. I'm worried that that's going to happen with the movie The Room mm -hmm. as as soon as uh, what's his name makes the movie about about the making of the film. <laughs> uh, oh, what's his name? 127 hours. James Franco. Yeah, he's doing he's doing a movie version of the book The Disaster Artist about the making of The Room, and he's going to be playing the guy. Uh, what's his name? Oh, I Mark. forget his name. But because I still the, have not the, seen the room. Oh, you really should. It's quite an amazing <laughs> movie. It's one of those movies, a lot like And God Spoke, where he set out to make the greatest movie of all time and it just comically failed. So now he's trying to say, Oh, I meant to make a comedy. Yes. <laughs> that was what I always meant to do was create the great greatest comedy of America. <laughs> so I'm just worried that, you know, the room is suddenly going to be, you know, when that movie comes out, my mom's going to know what the room is. Yes. That's always kind of like the, the judge for me when my mom knows it, <laughs> then it might not. That's, that's, it's the, I, it's weird because The Big Lebowski is such a strange movie and such a bizarre movie. And then in the world of the Coen brothers, it's sandwiched between two big successes of them. Because after The Big Lebowski, they did Oh Brother Where Art Thou and, and George Clooney and that damn song that you heard all the time. And it was a, it was a big, big hit and people loved that. Yeah. And before they did The Big Lebowski, they did freaking Fargo. Mm-hmm. And anything that followed Fargo wasn't going to be a big hit for them because Fargo was huge for the Coen brothers. Yeah. I kind of came into it the other way where I stayed away from the Big Lebowski for quite some time. Uh, and I was working with this guy. Uh, he was probably like 10 or so years younger than me. No, younger than that. He was a young guy. Yeah. So it had come up somewhere in conversation. He had never seen evil dead too, uh, which is, it's just one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, so I give him a videotape. Remember those? Oh God. And he comes back in the next day and he's like, I don't get it. And I was <laughs> like, fuck you. <laughs> What's not to get? This is comedy gold. <laughs> He's like, have you seen the big Lebowski? And it was like, all right, you know what? I give in. Okay. I've got yep. to now see the big Lebowski. And where, whereas it is no evil dead too. <laughs> yes. Very true. It's a damn fine movie. It's, it's, I, I don't, well, man, just in general, if somebody is like a good filmmaker, yeah. I, I tend not to particularly care for their work much. And I'm not like a really big Coen Brothers fan or anything like that. Pretty much I like Fargo and I like the Big Lebowski. That's about it. You know? I I really liked O Brother Where Art Thou for a while. Yeah. 
watched it in forever, but I really loved that movie. I don't know. I it. I don't know. I I it didn't click with me. I don't know why. But I like I. I real I like the movie itself. It's just when suddenly I'm seeing frat boys wearing a little Lebowski Urban Urban Achievers T-shirt. That's when I start losing interest in the Big Lebowski. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. and like, how can they really even understand it? <laughs> yeah. So I don't have I don't have the most things in the world about this week's movie. Yeah. But. Um, I do have some good stuff. I've got two lists. I've got uh, some some good good stuff. I've, the soundtrack, though, I could talk about that nonstop because I love the soundtrack for the Big Lebowski. It had a really great soundtrack. Yes. God, I love that soundtrack. That was a damn good soundtrack. <laughs> Freaking love that soundtrack. Okay, so this week's movie is. Baffled. Baffled. It's a made for TV movie starring Spock. <laughs> Spock. This week's movie, The Big Lebowski, is a. And I was trying to define the movie. Yeah. But this really is a movie that is beyond definition. Well, uh, it's it it's got a lot of similarities to a, a film noir type of movie yeah, except that you have pulled out robert mitchum and you've dropped in the dude instead yeah it's very it's a very good mystery it's a very good mystery movie yeah uh, it's also a comedy but it's not entirely a comedy because it is surprisingly at most times more of a mystery than it is a, a comedy. Yeah. Then there's one specific character that was airdropped into the entire thing who's certain that the movie is a Western. <laughs> yes. And he's like, I'm going to make this a Western. I'm going to make this a Western now. But it's not a Western. <laughs> but it is in the mind of that one Person and also their use of music and especially dream sequences and stuff of that sort. At times, this movie feels like a musical. Yes, in fact, it does very much. So it's a comedy western stoner mystery musical. It's 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 a mutt is what this movie is. It's a mutt. It is a charmingly bizarre cinematic mutt. <laughs> of a film. I'm not exactly sure how and why the movie has developed the fan base that it has, but we can get to that at at another time. Yes. This movie is a is an amalgam is what it is. Kind of like in Marvel Comics, there was one month in the history of Marvel Comics where Marvel and DC got together and they had they they shut down their two companies and they created a company called Amalgam Comics. I know. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. And for one month, they released characters that were amalgams of both of their companies. So they had um, Dr. Strange Fate. Dr. Strange Fate. Okay. Yeah. And they had um, uh, Bruce Wayne, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and stuff like that. Uh, the super soldier was like a, a Captain America Superman combination. Right. It, it, it was really bizarre. That's kind of like this movie. This movie is an amalgam. They've got they got about four different types of movies and they smushed them together <laughs> and then whatever was left over they did. It bombed once it came out. It made only 5 million dollars on its opening weekend and it cost 50 million dollars to make. I mean eventually it made that amount of money, but it 
it got some really bad reviews once it came out because it really is a bizarre, indescribable sort of a film. Yeah. It's tough to think of a film that is like this. It's tough to think of a film that was made after this that it would be similar to or that you could sort of compare it to. Well, it definitely looks like a Cohen movie, you know? Yes. And it's it's almost like, well, okay, let's take Raising Arizona and mix that with Fargo. And you pretty much come out with the dude. Yeah. Raising Arizona. God. <laughs> Nicholas Cage. I have a hard time getting through that movie, man. It's like, I'm okay, probably- I got it. They're Southern. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> you know? I love that I loved that movie for a while. I had a Cohen Brothers phase for a while. Yeah. Like all good sort of twenty something people, I I I became like I had a little film snob era yeah. to myself. And I would really seek out all of these art films and indie films and there would just be those weekends where I would, you know, be calling people up and Tom, okay, so we have to go see this film. It's French. It's done entirely with puppets, and it's about the Holocaust. Okay, now, <laughs> it's about an hour and a half drive, but if we leave now, we can catch the 6 o'clock showing. Can you pick me up? That I, sort of a thing. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was one of those people where I would really, really seek out so many different types of movies now it's difficult to get me into a theater i still watch a lot of movies but it i i'm married and i have three kids so it's a bit of a difficult i have to plan now yes to go see a movie i plan these things out i've got some people now i can go see movies with but still it takes some time and effort Uh uh-huh but I, I saw the film the day it came out. Here's an interesting thing. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about when I went to go see The Big Lebowski and what I thought about The Big Lebowski and all that sort of a thing. Right. I had no knowledge of the film when I went to go see it. All I knew were the people who were in the movie. And that's pretty much it. The previews really told you nothing about the movie. No, and that's all I had, yeah. Yeah. So how often does that happen to you, or really to anybody? The only other time I can think of that I went into a movie without knowing anything was um, Garden State. I heard that's good. I haven't seen it, though. I got a free pass to go and see it, and so I, I went to go see it solely based on the fact that Scrubs was in it. Yeah. I have a hard time thinking of his name now. I just know him as Scrubs, and I figured, <laughs> well, it's supposed to be like a like a comedy, and Scrubs is in it. Daddy. There are free passes, so I guess I'll go see it. But oh, wait, what, Maxwell? I gotta say something. Okay, uh, then tell something to the podcast. Be be loud so that they can hear you. What do you have to say to the podcast? Um, I uh, um. What are you what are you looking at? You've suddenly lost interest. Door? The door? Why are you do you like the door? Yeah. So you like doors? Yeah. Okay. He wants then to break say, on through to the other side. Maxwell, do you want to break on through to the other side? Mm, yeah. It, 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 go to the computer and say, This is the end. This is the end. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thanks, Maxwell. He just has to come in like every five or ten minutes and chime in. Yeah, check on and you. Leave. See what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really it's really quite cute. It, today, this morning, this morning we were watching we were watching some cartoon and something happened, and Maxwell said, "Daddy, did you see that?" And I I was kind of zoning out, and I'm like, "What? Yes, I saw that." And he said, "I can't believe that." I have to tell I have to tell podcast. 
I was like, really? You have to tell podcasts? Okay, well, we'll remember that this happened so you can tell podcasts. He forgot about it like five seconds later, but yes. I like the concept that there's a person named podcast. Yes. <laughs> that the podcast is an entity to him. I love that. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to tell podcast. It's adorable. But seriously, when was the last time that you saw a movie and you knew nothing about it? Because mm. I really do think that we live in the age of spoilers now. Not just in the fact that there are a lot of websites out there that, that can easily tell you everything that happens in a movie, but even the previews themselves will give you a rough estimate of exactly what you're going to see. Yeah. So you know what's up. Uh, I can't. Maybe. Uh, possibly that movie Frank. With the guy with the puppet head. I had oh, mentioned yes, that before. Yes. yes. That yes. was something where it's like, okay, his, his name is Frank. He's got a puppet head. I've heard it's good. That's like yeah. about it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I really liked Garden State, but I have a feeling that the only reason that I liked the movie is because I knew nothing about it. Yeah. I feel like if I had known more about the film and gone to see it, that I might not have liked it because it is a bit of like a, like a almost preachy sort of indie art film. Uh -huh. Like, it's not dead. It's trying really hard to be indie. Yeah. Finger quotes. And it's 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 way too like stop trying to be adorable. <laughs> stop it, film. You're a film. It's really it's it's kind of you'll either like the film or you won't. That's pretty much it. Right. But I think I liked it because I had no clue whatsoever. And I think that's the case with The Big Lebowski. I think nowadays most people have a vague understanding of The Big Lebowski. So it's impossible, unless you saw it once it came out, to really go into it not knowing anything. And, and it, may, it may just wind up getting worse because he is a, a pot-smoking hero now. Yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. There's, there's so no escaping and no denying it. So um, I, I wanted to mention Sarah. I just got an email from her. So uh, we should talk about that. Hey, but before we talk about Sarah and my story, maybe we should take a little break. That sounds like a good idea. So we will be right back. Do you like comic books? Um, me too! Do you listen to podcasts? Are you still talking to me? Cool! I have one called The Comic Book Update. So? I do weekly reviews of story arcs, comic miniseries, ongoing titles, and more! I don't care. I know, right? So all you have to do is go to the website at comicbookupdate.com. Why would I do that? We post daily previews of new comic books every day! Ugh. Someone save me. And every weekend is Cosplay Sunday, with blog posts featuring cosplayers from around the world. Excuse me, miss. Is this guy bothering you? Back off, buddy. She's with me. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, sorry. Nerd rage. Oh, yeah. So check out the comic book update at comicbookupdate.com as well as on iTunes and stream it live on Stitcher. The comic book update, the antidote for nerd rage. So Maxwell, today we are talking about the movie The Big Lebowski. What do you think about that movie? I want it every time and then and then and then and then. Oh, you watch it every time and then and then and then? There was a booyah. There was a, there was a booyah? Do it. Okay, there was a booyah. Say, say it loud. Say booyah. 
that was not a booyah. And you're also talking into my uh, SD card slot. I don't know if that's the microphone. Hello. Okay. So maybe you should stop talking into my SD card slot. <laughs> That sounds vaguely dirty. It's if I was a robot, that would be filthy. You would have to pay extra for that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, so we were talking about Sarah. Um, I, w I wanted to talk at length about Sarah. About uh, Sarah. Uh, she is an ex-girlfriend of mine. But we're still really close, and it's pretty amazing that that happens, because when you think back of all of my exes, you know that phrase, you know, don't burn any bridges? Right. Okay, so I apparently burn bridges, and then I set up detonators and explode what hasn't been burned of the bridge. But and that's, then, okay. that's okay when it comes to exes. And you then if you have anything left of the bridge, I get a jackhammer, and I take apart the remainder of the bridge brick by brick. When it comes to X's and I, usually the block function of Facebook is required. Okay. <laughs> that is usually what happens in the world of Mr. Steve's X's. But for whatever reason... And I think it might have something to do with her mom. But Sarah and I have just been the absolute best. You know, and that's nice. Yeah. So sometimes I'll look at Sarah and, you know, we're sharing pictures of our kids and talking and, you know, coming up with plans to see each other. And then I look at all the others and I'm like, how come you can't be like this, Debbie? You <laughs> fail. <laughs> Bitch, can't you be as awesome as Sarah? We're the best of friends. <laughs> so way to go, Colleen. You suck. <laughs> but when I met Sarah, um, her mom had always had health problems, and her dad always seemed to be inches away from death. Yeah. And he was in, like, a home somewhere, and he didn't have the best health. And I'm not sure how this happened, because we didn't see uh, Sarah's dad often. But somehow, I went to go see The Big Lebowski the day it came out with Sarah, my girlfriend at the time, and her mom and dad. Uh-huh, okay. I have no idea how this happened, because I don't remember ever seeing a movie with... Uh, Sarah's mom before or after this and I hardly ever saw her dad because he was always on the verge of death like the crypt keeper constantly <laughs> and it, it, so I'm not exactly sure how I went to go see a movie with them period right. let alone a movie like The Big Lebowski yeah. but is she she was always a uh, Sarah's mom was always very, very, very uh, strict Catholic, very religious. She was really nice to people, and she was always doing good things for other people. She was a really, really wonderful person. Hi, Maxwell. You have a cracker in your mouth. Cool. Thanks for sharing that with the podcast. <laughs> don't jump on Emma's bed. I'm already in trouble enough being in this room doing the podcast, so don't. Don't roll around on the bed either, or eat crackers in her bed. I'm going to get in so much trouble from this podcast. <laughs> but uh, Sarah's mom, she was very, very Catholic. She was very strict Catholic. She was very, very nice. And eventually, when the cancer started killing her, uh -huh. she, she was in the hospital constantly, and I had heard that she had asked for a priest or a minister of some sort from the church that she went to all the time for yeah. a priest to come and visit her at church. And no priest came to see her. And oh. she was really upset about that. Yeah. It's like she never missed church. She was there all the time. And here she is, and she's on her deathbed, and nobody would come and see her. 
So when I went to go see her in the hospital, technically this wasn't a lie. I told the nurse to tell her that a minister from St. Simon and Jude was here to see her, which technically wasn't a lie because I went to school at St. Simon and Jude uh-huh. uh, many years ago, and I was a minister. So I went to go see her, and she was all happy, and she was like, oh, I didn't think somebody would actually show up, and you're the only person to show up, but I'm happy that it was you. Oh, nice. Because I didn't want to see anyone else. I'm happy that it was you, and she, she was just so happy, and, and ah, it, it's, I remember her not liking it, but in that way where you're trying to be nice, you know, one of those like, oh, it was a very interesting interesting movie yes exactly the like mom nice you know like oh no it was it was good there were some funny parts it, the story was interesting right and interesting is always what you use if you really don't like a movie and you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings yeah yeah so i thought that it would be nice to get an interview with sarah and try and and hear from from her what she thought about it and she was really excited and I shot her some questions and she was working on the answers but she is having some fairly severe health problems recently oh. and so she is she is back in the hospital and uh, she is on the road to recovery and getting a lot better but good, she good. is She's currently in the hospital, and she could not... Uh, I just learned about 10 or 15 minutes ago that she wasn't going to be able to to do an interview with us, so that's sad. But I still wanted to give a shout-out to Sarah, because I saw this with her, and I still want to figure out how it is that I went to go see... Like, a, an uncomfortable situation, seeing a movie with the in-laws. Yes that perhaps you shouldn't go and see with uh, well, I'm trying to think of another uncomfortable movie situation well on the bright side it wasn't deep throat yeah that's a good point I I, I really want to I really want to that reminds me of a little bit of trivia, so I want to go to one of my lists. I have a big list here of Lebowski trivia. Okay. And I, I find it to be quite interesting. And I I judge whether or not this is interesting by telling it to my family and seeing if they care. Okay. Because most of the time they're too busy with their own lives to really care about what I have to say about my own weird little thing, but they really thought that this was interesting so I'm, I have high hopes for this list okay. is what I'm saying but um, how many times is the word man used in this movie that's in the form of a question to you what is 185 Alex that's pretty close actually 147 times 147 times yeah, yeah. And so I, and I think a lot of other people, assumed that a lot of that was ad-libbed. But I found it interesting. I was reading a bunch of articles and stuff, and uh, one book. And because I have a book of the making of The Big Lebowski that came out with the movie The Big Lebowski. Yeah. Because Apparently, they thought that this movie, their follow-up to the Academy Award-winning Fargo, that this follow-up was going to be so huge that they had to make a big, huge, massive book about the making of The Big Lebowski. <laughs> and the movie bombed, and so the book went out of print, but now the movie is con hailed to be huge, and so, well, good, we made this book for you guys. Sort of a thing. Uh -huh. So... Apparently, uh, the only ad libbed line is when the dude uh, calls someone a human paraquat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is an ad libbed line from uh, Mr. Bridges. 
and everything else in the movie, including every man and every fuck, every little bit of the rest of the script is actually scripted for the movie. Wow. I find that to be a good thing. Yeah. So how many times is the F word used in this movie? And by F word, I do mean fuck. How many times is the word fuck used in this movie? I'll go 82 on that. You need to go a lot higher. A lot higher, really? Higher. Yeah. Does it does it outrank man? Yes. Really? Okay, cuz I was thinking it would be under man somewhere. In that case, uh 175. Okay, there are two numbers of the amount of times fuck is used in the movie. And I tried to figure out why I was getting the two numbers. Apparently, one number is the amount of times that just the word fuck is used. And the second number is the how many times that the word fuck and fuck's variations are <laughs> used in the film. So the word fuck is used 260 times. If you count fuck and its various variations, uh -huh. it is used 292 times, and that is a number that apparently tops the number of times the word fuck is used in the film Scarface. And the interesting thing that I think about this factoid is, I would not have believed you had I not have learned that fact before I saw the movie. <laughs> Again, for this podcast. Because I, when you think about The Big Lebowski, you don't really think of too much foul language. You no. think of an occasional shut the fuck up Donnie, but that's about it. But I learned this factoid right before I saw the movie for like the bajillionth time for this podcast. And sure enough, oh yeah, they use the F word a goddamn shit ton in this movie. <laughs> they use it a lot. And another thing, I fucking hate the movie Scarface. Uh, yeah, I, ha I haven't seen it since it came out. I hate the movie Scarface because they they got a a, a movie from like the forties, uh, like a gangster movie called right. Scarface, and then somebody got that uh, Brian De Palma, and he's that, like, "That was Brian De Palma, yeah, yeah." Let's update this for the modern day, except let's make it ultra violent. So they make this ultra violent movie about this gangster, and then somehow the actual like street gangster community now looks at Scarface and says, okay, well, this is an interesting documentary. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to base my life on this ridiculously stupid film. I'm going to buy Scarface t-shirts and Scarface posters, and I'm just going to live my life like this horrible fucking person in this goddamn movie. I feel the same way for Breaking Bad, except I might actually break down and watch Breaking Bad, because it's supposed to be amazing. But I see a lot of people nowadays uh, uh, kind of seeing Breaking Bad as a documentary, too. Hey, maybe I should make meth. Maybe I can kill my girlfriend in the same way. Hey, maybe I can mirror these horrible things I'm watching on this TV show. And I really do feel that Scarface has ruin society I, I don't really do horrible very well anymore and that might just be a product of me being old but yeah because of that I, I tried a little Breaking Bad and it's like okay, you know I got the point I don't need to go on with the show it's just you know kind of too depressing I don't you know and that's the same way I gave like Sons of Anarchy a miss too which I hear is really pretty good you know yeah. but I I, I I can't spend my time like that anymore, you know what I mean? Sons of Anarchy is really popular in the Midwest. Yeah. People fucking love this goddamn show. Like When I was in California, I think Sons of Anarchy was starting, but I didn't hear a single person talk about it. I, I heard one or two people talk about it only because uh, Hellboy is in it. Right. Or was in it? Is he still in it? I don't even know. I don't, I, I know he was, well, the show is over now, so. Oh, they don't do the show anymore? No, I think this was the last season. 
Oh, well, hold on. I think it's... Is it in this magazine? I've got this magazine in front of me. Uh, Sons of... No, it's not. Okay. I've got this special issue of Entertainment Weekly. It's $14, Daddy. and it's the Binge Guide. Yeah. 32 perfect shows to Daddy. binge watch. Daddy. Yes, Maxwell. You know where Twitter is. Do I know where Twitter is? It's on the internet. No, what are you talking about? Sweater. Sweater? Sweater. Treasure. Are you saying you're saying treasure? Yeah. Um, it's the treasure. It's in the hills of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Glad I figured that out. Uh what was I saying? Oh yeah, I fucking hate Scarface. Yes. I think some of that has to do with one of my cousins. I say cousins with finger quotes because he was adopted, but he, he, he may or may not have killed a cop. Oh, okay. And he may or may not have spent a lot of time in prison. I'm not exactly sure because I saw him all the time and then suddenly he wasn't around anymore and none of our family told us why. Yeah. So my brother did some investigating snooping and found out that he was in jail for this and that and so he loved Scarface. Okay, he loved well, this you movie. know, there you go. Absolutely loved this horrible, stupid movie and the one time that I saw it, the one time that I saw Scarface was the one time that he sat down his one-year-old son and had Scarface on like it was freaking Oogie Loves or Sesame Street. <laughs> and he's all like, oh yeah, he loves Oogie Love. He loves Scarface. This is his favorite movie. Don't you like Scarface? And it's like, okay, you are blonde-haired and blue-eyed. You are adopted. You do not get to talk like a Mexican. <laughs> You do not get to talk like a Mexican gang member. I know you're from Tucson, but that doesn't mean you get to talk like this. <laughs> he sent me some charcoal drawings of uh, like a horror movie characters from prison once. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, hey, Stevie, I know you like bad movies like this, so here you go. I can send you more. But my parents didn't allow me to write any letter back to him. Right. So I believe he is out of jail now. Uh-huh. Uh, I haven't really had any contact with him. So if he's listening, uh, don't kill me because it's not my fault. That's that's always a phrase to go with. Uh-huh. Just and in also, general. And I, also, I, and I, also I say that when I'm, I'm... I'm talking about a different Scarface than the one you love. I'm talking about Scarface the Musical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which Just, has got to exist out there somewhere. No, yeah, it absolutely does. Absolutely does have to exist somewhere. They're turning everything into musicals. Yeah, pretty much. I'm still, I'm still hoping to do a one-man musical version of Jurassic Park. Yes, Maxwell? What do you have to say to the podcast? In our trap in the wall in a marshmallow. You were trapped in the wall in a marshmallow? Yeah. Then oh. there was no way out. There was no way out? Did you eat your way out of the marshmallow? Then there was a way out. Oh, there was? Then there was a hole. There was a hole? A big hole. Oh, I've known some big holes. Haven't we all? Yeah. Then I got a backpack, a flying backpack. A and flying backpack? And two flying things. Oh, and two flying things. And it rolls. It flies way out. Awesome. Then it blow. Then it exploded? Were you okay? Did you die? No. Oh, good. Then I come and then I get the marmalade, then I put it in here, and then I eat them. Oh, cool. Why don't you go and watch the Netflix? Mm. 
that was a wonderful story. I can't wait to hear what happens next. Uh, me either. It, it, it was gripping. Uh, it was a little wordy in spots. Yeah. You know, I you know, got to be honest. Uh, yeah. But but uh, you just felt that there was a really major twist coming there someplace. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to hear what happens. So a uh, Comedy Central occasionally plays The Big Lebowski. And I find this to be amazing. Okay. So when Comedy Central plays it, they've got to edit it. And so they change the line that Walter says, do you see what happens, Larry? Oh, this God. is what happens, Larry, when you fuck a stranger in the ass. There has got to be a rap version of that on YouTube. I meant to look it up, but I forgot. Oh, absolutely. Like the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt theme song. There's got to be like a songify version of that. Yeah, but, but because it, just in that whole rant that he's doing, it, it just it just picks up a rhythm of its own. Yes, it's exactly. like, see what you get, see what you get, see what you get when you fuck another man in the ass, see what you get, see what you get. You know, it's just like, it picked up its own rhythm. Yeah. But when they play the movie, when they play the movie on the, pod, the Comedy Central, they edit that line too. This is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> nice. That is wonderful. Nice. The, the worst one I have ever heard, though, is I was flipping channels and I found it on the Lifetime station years ago. They were playing mall rats. Oh god! And in mall rats, in the, close to the beginning, there's a conversation where Jason Lee is talking about, uh, you know, about how he broke up with his girlfriend and things like that. And it was like, yeah. oh, this is even worse when I farted when she was going down on me. Yeah. They changed. They changed fart to vomit. Like, that doesn't even make sense. I mean, you've just taken this and made it so much worse. <laughs> it is so much more disgusting now. Listening to him to go on about she was going down on him and he vomited. And, and whenever he gets really relaxed, he vomits. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty horrible. That was, the, that was the worst case of censorship I have come across so far. I remember seeing a lot of that sort of a thing in uh, on Phoenix Television. They used to do that a lot. They'd play some movie, and they'd edit it like crazy. Um, and it makes me kind of wonder if the filmmakers have any kind of input on the censorship of their film. Yeah. Like, yeah. okay, we have to change this word. Do you have a preference of what you want to change it to? Vomit. Can we say vomit? Oh, we can say vomit. Yeah. Go for that. <laughs> um, here's another really interesting bit of trivia. I, I find this amazing. The dude is in every scene in the movie. Yes, he is. Which is a very old school mystery sort of a, here is the lead character and he's going to take us through everything. Even in the scene where the nihilists are eating pancakes, a van drives past behind them with the dude and Walter driving it. So even in scenes that they aren't in, they are in that scene. And I find that interesting. Another interesting bit of trivia, the dude never bowls in the movie. He has never seen bowling. Uh, yeah, now that you point it out. And this is amazing. I'm, I'm going to put this in a form of a question because I find it to be incredible. How many times does the dude speak to Donnie in the film? Not at all, I would say. Nope, 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 nope. A little higher. A little higher? Okay. Yeah. 
twice. Yes. Absolutely. He only speaks to Donnie twice in the entire film. And those are times when he's walking away and he yells something like he's leaving. Your yeah. phone's ringing, dude. Thank you, Donnie. <laughs> I find that to be interesting. Also, Donnie another- was also not connected to the story at all. He was, you know, there was this whole story kind of going on. Donnie knew about it, but Donnie was still always just the guy they bowled with. Yes. Yes, he was never fully a part of it. Yeah. I One of the things that I remember when I first saw the movie and that I thought about was, um, how does the dude financially live his lifestyle? That was one of the things that I remember thinking is yeah. how is this man able to continue living like this without any sort of job or job skills? How does he how is he able to do this? Apparently in the original script, uh, he was the heir to the inventor of the Rubik's Cube. Nice. So he got a, a small fortune from the creation of the Rubik's Cube, but they thought that it would be better for the story if they just left that a mystery. So they took all of the Rubik's Cube references out of the film. I find that to be intriguing, because that was one of the things that I thought about this film. And a bit disappointing, because I have always wanted a real, serious Rubik's Cube movie. Yes. This movie could have done for the Rubik's Cube what it did for bowling. Yes. And it made me feel like I wanted to go bowling, and I hate bowling. Everybody hates yeah, bowling. I had, a, I had a great big Rubik's Cube phase. Not Rubik's Cube, bowling phase yeah. for a while. Yeah. Because of this movie, yeah. where we all had to go bowling. A big, <laughs> this did a lot for bowling, did you, you I didn't, think. You this didn't, join a league though did you no 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 my dad was in a league when we were growing up and we would go with him and we would really pay attention my my father um my father found a way to get my my older brother and i interested in bella can you not lucha maxwell in the room right now. No, don't shake him either. Don't shake the baby. Hey, Bella, Bella. Okay. One of the things um, is so my dad, he, he came up with a wonderful way to get us invested in the bowling game because they had great arcade games at the bowling alley. Yeah. So every time he got a strike, we got a quarter. Nice, okay. So literally, you've never seen two kids more invested in an adult playing bowling. <laughs> because they had some damn good games. I, I, I find myself... He, I, I went to a, a doctor about six years ago, and I was talking to him about my stress levels and this and that, and Dr. Dr. Wu was his name. Uh, or Dr. He was Asian. His, his name was Dr. Wu, like a bad guy from a movie. He was the Steely fiendish, Dan song. Yeah, he was the fiendish Dr. Wu. <laughs> you ever seen the movie Black Dynamite? Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, I love that movie. I love that movie. I have random quotes from that uh, listed as music on my phone. So you'll hear like a, you'll hear a, a Beatles song, and then you'll hear a, like a Pink Floyd song, and then suddenly you'll hear um, your knowledge of scientific biological transmogrification is only unmatched by your vest for by your zest for kung fu treachery yeah. <laughs> for a while I had that as a as a text notification on my phone but I took it off because I was in the children's department I was in the children's section of a library in Norman 
and I'm there checking out uh, Sesame Street books, and then suddenly you hear from my pants, Who the hell is interrupting my kung fu? <laughs> Which is not a good thing to hear coming out of a Mexican's pants. <laughs> So I'm like, oh, I better change that because there are situations in which that won't be a good thing to hear coming from my crotchal region. There, but my doctor... Are, there are very few things that are good, regardless of what your race is. Yeah. You know, yeah. just sp speaking crotches in general are fairly frightening. <laughs> I, I don't... I don't I don't really butt dial people, but I will butt open an app sometimes. Okay. So I was at work and I was straightening like our toddler area of books. And then suddenly, apparently, I butt opened up my Macho Man Randy Savage soundboard. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> so here I am, and I'm putting books away, and I'm straightening stuff, and then suddenly from my pants, you just hear, Snap into it! Oh, yeah! No, Snap into a Slim Jim! Oh, yeah! Snap into a Slim Jim! Oh, yeah! Not a good thing to hear. Also, not a good thing to hear coming from someone's pants. Yes. Not a good thing. But my doctor told me that, that in order to cut down on stress levels, that I should, before I go home from work, I should go and do something that I like. And for some reason, the first thing that came to my mind was playing a pinball machine. Yeah. And so I couldn't, and so I, I, I became like a pinball machine hunter and going everywhere looking for pinball tables. And I quickly came up with a rule. If you are a bowling alley and you don't have a pinball table, you're not a bowling alley. Okay. I, I can accept that. Yeah, I think everybody can accept that. Uh -huh. It's a very, very simple rule. Yes! You need to have a bowling alley. Period. And, uh, and you really, you know, this might be stretching the bowling alley rules a bit, but I think you would need, you would also need a really old drunk woman who thinks she's still hot. Yes. And, yeah. Yes. And really bad food. <laughs> yeah. she'll, she'll whip she'll, her boobs out in a second, but nobody really wants her to. <laughs> yeah. And uh, chili cheese fries with quotation marks around them. Yeah. Around the chili and around the cheese. <laughs> Not around the fries part. Speaking of, they are currently working on a Big Lebowski pinball table. I would have thought they would have done that years ago. You would have thought they would have done that years ago because there is currently only one company in America that is still making pinball tables. Really? Is it still Midway? I'm about to find out right now. It's quite sad because freaking pinball. Yeah. And everybody loves pinball. The Big Lebowski Pinball.com is the website that explains the game. It shows you the artwork and the table. There's a white Russian on, on the table, and you're bowling while you do it. And it comes with a rug. You can upgrade the Big Lebowski table to come with a, a rug that says the Big Lebowski and will tie your room together. <laughs> yes. Yes. That yeah. was such a great running gag. Yeah. That's, that's the thing about this movie. It just had, had non-stop almost great moments. You know? Yes. Yes. And so very stylized for the type of movie that it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could you could rewrite it for Cheech and Chung. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's created by a new company called Dutch Pinball, 
they this will be their first pinball table that they've ever made. They're currently getting pre-orders for the Big Lebowski um, pinball machine. Do we trust the Dutch? I don't know. I don't know. I I, I have never heard them being very big in the uh, whole pinball technology. The world of pinball? Yeah, so I'm, I would be a little leery of that. I would trust the Japanese. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'd trust the Japanese with a lot. Yeah. But because the, the Japanese... The Japanese are a very smart race, and you have to be smart if your country is constantly being attacked by monsters. Yes. Then you have to know, you know, you'll have to step up your game, because here in America, how many monster attacks? Not a lot. Mostly in New York. Mostly in New York, and yeah, not, not very many at all. Uh-huh. That's the one thing that always bothered me with Marvel comic books. Is that if Marvel comic books really existed, there can't be too many people still living in New York. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, New York would be an empty wasteland because, like, oh, look, it's a Tuesday, and now who's attacking? <laughs> oh, it's Thanos, and he's turning everyone into undead zombie slaves. Okay, moving. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's time to head for the suburbs. <laughs> right? Like, Jesus, just fucking move already. Seriously. Not this many people would still be living in New York after all of the shit that goes down. Hey, hey, God, it's no books. place to raise a kid, no. Freaking New York. So, um, I, I feel the need, if we're talking about the Big Lebowski, to mention the fact that the Big Lebowski is loosely based on the works of Mr. Raymond Chandler. Well, there we go. Raymond Chandler is an American mystery author that society dictates I must think of as a genius. Yes. He uh, created The Private Eye, Philip Marlowe, and The Big Sleep, and The Long Goodbye, and also other things that society demands that I think of as wonderful. <laughs> Picking up that you're not a fan, huh? It's not that I'm not a fan. It's just I'm also not not a fan. I've, I've just never read him. Yeah. I think it comes down to the fact that... I don't think anybody's <laughs> ever actually read him. <laughs> See, that's the thing. I, I think that... I mentioned earlier that I had my little film snob period. Right. I think that most people, when they enter that college period of their lives, uh, they in they don't go for being a film snob. They become like a literary snob. Right. So I never read um, Kerouac or Raymond Chandler or Kurt Vonnegut or Bukowski, or whoever that guy is who wrote uh, even Cowgirls Get the Blues. Like, I never read any of those people. Right. I read some, art I, I read some article, I think it was written by um, the by the guy who wrote Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs uh, and Fargo, Rock City. Chuck Losterman, I, and I believe he said that that most people, when they go into college, they they have this period where they have to read things in the hopes that once they're done reading it, they can put the book on a shelf and then invite a woman into where they live, and the woman can see those books on their shelf and think, "Look at those books! I will have sex with a man who owns these books." <laughs> And I never had that phase. I never had an intellectualism phase. I'm going to be smart. I'm going to read this and this and this. I did that for movies. Right. But I never did that for novels. I never tried to be smarter than anyone else. I mean, obviously. Yeah. I Just look at me. I obviously never... I was not an overachiever when I was in school. 
So I wound up reading a lot of those books after I was out of school. You know, just like, okay, why was this in every class? <laughs> That's what yeah. I would need to find out. Yeah. I remember I got an A-plus on my report of the book 1984, my freshman year of college. Yeah. Despite the fact that I uh, read the book in one day. Uh-huh. I've never done that before with a single book. But I was late on making the paper, on, on writing the paper. So I read the book in one whole day, wrote an article about it, and the professor was just... Oh, I can't believe it, Steve. You really, you really grasped the subject. It's like, and I, I didn't want to tell the professor. It's not that I didn't grasp the subject. It's just that, you know, society has dictated that this book is about this and this and this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I never had a Raymond Chandler phase. Uh. E I like a good noir from time to time. Uh, I've never read any, read any like Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hammett books or anything like that. I have a, I have a friend who named uh, his son Dashiell. Was it for that reason, or did he just think it was a cool name? No, no, it was for that reason. It was for that reason. It was my director friend. Um, whose name was originally Jason Alexander, but apparently there's someone famous named Jason Alexander. Yeah. So, so he went by the name Michael Alessandro, solely because it sounded really good. And he he was my uh, guerrilla theater mentor in Phoenix, and we did a lot of plays together. And I was in Reservoir Dogs, which I've mentioned before, uh -huh. and Fight Club and a bunch of other plays. He was going to do a theatrical version of the movie Suicide Kings, and I was going to play the part of Ira, which is now played by the little smarmy, nerdy guy with the glasses who's on The Big Bang Theory. I do not watch The Big Bang Theory, so I wouldn't know who no, that is. No, I... I uh... The boyfriend from Roseanne. The boyfriend no, no, from no, Roseanne. No. Um, David. I don't know. He had gla he had glasses and he was nerdy. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. David. I think that might have been him. Yeah. Yeah. So he he wrote this really good mystery script, and he was going to turn it into a movie for a while. He was like an executive director, sort of a person. He was living in San Francisco, and he was like an executive working at Alcatraz. Okay. So he came up with a script idea where it's in the near future, and the government has sold Alcatraz to a company that has transformed it into an insane asylum. But there's a, some breakout, and all of the inmates have gotten out. And someone goes in there to try and make sense of everything, and it it it's a really good mystery sort of a story. And he wrote a part specifically for me, and I was going to be nude in the whole thing. Okay. So for the whole movie, I was going to be nude and masturbating. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And then I read the script, and I'm like, Oh my god, this is a great fucking script. You have written an amazing mystery. Uh, story and there's a bunch of twists and I didn't know what was happening until the exact ending of the film and this is great. Okay, I'll be nude and masturbating for you. I, you know, I, you Mr. Know, Alessandro, I, I, I could rub one or two out, but not all day. Yeah, yeah. That's asking now, a bit much. Now he is living somewhere on the East Coast as a restaurateur. Uh huh. Which is a shame because that script was really good, and he was going to film it in Alcatraz. He's also the person that made me uh, learn Yiddish because he had that great idea, which I mentioned on another podcast, for a rat race tribute group crime movie. 
That was a good idea. That was a damn good idea. Anyway, uh, what so were we like talking about? a tribute band? Yeah, it's a tribute band, but the Frank Sinatra leaves to go do something else. So the rest of the group are like very violently cutthroat trying to be the next Frank. Okay. It's a great idea. Just that general concept is fucking wonderful. Yeah. So what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, Raymond Chandler. Yeah. So uh, Michael Alessandro. He was a big fan of mystery novels, so he named his son Dashiell, and good for him. My son was named after the one Beatles song about a serial killer. Mm -hmm. Maxwell's Silverhammer. The other day, my the other day my wife was uh, hammering something into the wall and my son got a hold of the big huge hammer and said daddy I'm going to hammer something and I took it away from him and he started crying and he's like daddy why? It's like because I know what's going to happen there is a song about this. You can't have hammers. No. You know how you get when you, you get around women. Right. <laughs> it's going to be Oogie Loves on a meat hook all over again. Yes. <laughs> I love that video. I love that video. That it's, is, it's yeah. The best way to explain that movie. <laughs> so, this is a great film. The Big Lebowski. Yes. It's a great film, but it came out and it bombed. And I, it, and really, if you're going to talk about The Big Lebowski and why it bombed, I really think you have to talk about Fargo. Because it's important to remember that The Big Lebowski was the follow-up to the Academy Award-winning motion picture Fargo. Which is pretty much always a curse. Yeah. Fargo was a huge, huge success. Especially a success considering the fact that before they did Fargo, uh, the Coen brothers did the Hudsucker Proxy, uh. which was never... Des it's a wonderful movie, but it, in no time period could that movie have ever been a big success. Yeah. I thought it was kind of a boring, pretentious piece of shit. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bizarre little film. Yeah. Is what it is. It's like a weird fairy tale, like a corporate fairy tale. Kinda. Kinda. Yeah. Really weird, big, huge flop in the box office, really bad reviews. So they followed that up with Fargo. It got seven Oscar nominations, widespread critical acclaim. Siskel and Ebert called it the best film of 1996. So suddenly the Coen brothers are like Hollywood darlings. So they decide to follow it up with the weirdest fucking movie that they could possibly come up with. <laughs> A bowling western stoner mystery comedy. Uh huh. That's basically and, it. Yeah. Oh, another piece of trivia. Um, he drinks nine white Russians in this movie. I find that to be interesting. I had a big white Russian phase because of this movie. I had a white Russian phase, and I had a bowling phase because of this goddamn movie. <laughs> I have. I have another list, but it's a weird one. Okay. It's just little things I love about this movie. Because there are a lot of little things that I love about this movie. If someone said, what do you love about this movie? I wouldn't be able to explain it. But I, there are a million little things that I goddamn love about this movie. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, tons. I love the Mexican cop. That gives dude shit about leads. Yes. I love that. Mm -hmm. Leads. And then really, I, you, you can't say Mexican without just mentioning Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, God. That is a wonderful character. He is still trying. Uh, the Coen brothers said that they just refused to do any sequels to any of their films. And that they'll, you'll never catch them doing one. But the actor himself, uh, John Turturro, yes. still absolutely is 100% vehement about wanting to do a Jesus movie. 
That was, you know, every every just frame he is in, every second is just solid gold. And the introduction, like, I, I don't think I've ever seen a character ever introduced better in any movie. Yes. You, you got who this guy is. You don't need words. <laughs> just look at him. <laughs> God, that is... God, I... He is amazing. He is amazing in this movie. You know, Absolutely and, amazing. That's what I mean for for a movie that is a, a fairly stupid movie. Yeah. You know? Ish. Yeah. Ish. A very big ish. Yeah. <laughs> then you get into scenes like that that are so artistically done and just these little sequences that are that are captivating absolutely wonderful like him tongue kissing his kissing his bowling ball yeah yeah the other scene that really caught me like that is the beach party scene Oh yes, when you first meet uh, ben Jackie Gazzara, Trejo. Yeah. Yeah. The Ben Gazzara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another With thing the naked that girl I... being bounced up and down on the blanket and just the whole yeah. look of everybody's faces and Yeah, the faces. Yeah. And the, another thing that I love is the romanticism of bowling. I mean, there are a lot of sports out there, and they have been romanticized in a lot of movies. Uh -huh. But you would be hard pressed to find another movie that does what this movie does for bowling. This movie loves its bowling. Yes, it does. It absolutely does. Another thing I love about this movie is how it made white Russians cool. Yes. Love white Russians. Another thing that I like about this movie now, I didn't like it before, but I like this now. Um, in and out Burger. Yeah. See, in Arizona, up until the point that I moved, I believe there is one now, but there was never an in and out Burger in Arizona. It was more of a West Coast sort of thing. And we were near West Coast, but we weren't West Coast. We were in the goddamn desert. So I never had an In-N-Out Burger. I never understood why so many people loved In-N-Out Burger. Mm -hmm. Never had an In-N-Out Burger. So then I moved to California, and I had In-N-Out Burger. And I'm like, so I, don't, I still don't get what the big deal is. I mean, In-N-Out Burger is good. But it's not like the greatest burger in the world. Still don't understand what the big deal is. And then I moved as far away from California as possible. And all I'm thinking of being here in Oklahoma is, God, I wish I could have an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> God, those are fucking well, good. See, oh, man, I miss those fucking In-N-Out burgers. See, I'm East Coast, so it's it's White Castles for me, and it's the same thing. See, Except never that had one. Never except, had one. Except that when it comes to White Castle, most of us will freely admit that they're shit. They're I've not, had, they're not I've good. Had, <laughs> I've had microwavable White Castles. With the, do those count? Uh, well, it's better than no White Castle at all, you know. But no, they're not as they're not as they're not the same <laughs> as getting them off of the grill. Yeah. You know, God. I mean, Castle. White Castle is very much an East Coast in and out burger. That's a very astute assessment. You know, White Castle is more like. It seems to me like people will just, just up and be like, hey, let's go to an In and Out, okay? And get some In and Out burgers. No, White Castle, you have to have drank a couple of quarts of Colt 45. Then you go to the White Castle. God. And I, I drank a lot of Colt 45 in my day. Yeah. Ate a lot of White Castle. Wow. Mm -hmm. I miss. I really miss 
And I really miss In and Out Burger. So I like the fact that this is a movie. It's a movie set in L.A. It's a California movie, and that's In and Out Burger. You know, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Another thing that I like, and I think this is more of like a Steve thing and not an everybody thing, but the limo driver that's telling jokes to the dude. Yeah. That's uh, a stand-up comedian uh-huh. whose name is Dom Irera. Dom Irera, yeah. Never and too he fond was of him, but he told his best joke. Um, I'm a big fan of his, but only because of how obsessed I used to be with Dr. Cat's professional therapist. Oh, uh. And he was on there, it seems like every third episode was a Dom Irera episode. So I just, I loved Dr. Cat's professional therapist. So the fact that Dom Irera appears really randomly, (laughs) there's no real explanation as to why this, like, smart-mouthed New York, vaguely Jewish-seeming community Median is driving a limo in the middle of the movie, just appears, tells a joke, and then that's it. Yeah. You know? And they had another character that almost, almost it seems sort of like it just, it just take the movie takes a pause and does something kind of related. You know what I mean? I mean, how do I put this? Like, even Dom Herrera's joke. You know, Mm -hmm. the dude could have been doing a lot of complaining at this point with everything that he's gone through. But he's the dude, so he's not really going to complain about things. He's just going to kind of ride them out. You see what I mean? I mean, so it almost puts like a cap on a certain aspect of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the detective who uh, he's actually looking for, for the girl because of their, her parents hired him. Yeah, the Knudsons. The Knudsons, yeah. I mean, this is throwaway. It's not adding anything to the story. But it almost makes makes the movie stop for a second and be like, okay, if you didn't catch everything that was really going on up until this point... This is everything that's been going on up until this point. I was thinking, I, I think of that guy a lot, the guy who was the the detective, because my brother, my older brother, Joe, he, um, he had this friend named Ray, and Ray was a big mystery. He was just six foot two and he had this long hair and a beard and he knew everyone and he knew everything that was going on. And then one day my friend Ray just went to my brother and said, hey, do you want to go see the movie The Crow? And my brother said, what are you talking about? We can't go see the movie The Crow. Brandon Lee just died a few months ago and I heard they weren't going to release that movie. And Ray said, yeah, well, the direct, the guy who created the comic books has a cut of the movie, and he's secretly going to comic book stores and doing screenings. Oh, yeah. So do you want to go see the movie? And my brother has learned at that point that just say yes to whatever Ray says. So my brother went with Ray, and he met James O'Barr, and he got a copy of the Crow graphic novel signed, and he saw a rough cut of the Crow way before the movie came out, and James O'Barr answered any and all questions that anyone had to ask him, and somebody asked him, it's like, okay, so who killed Brandon Lee? And the director said, I won't tell you who killed him, but I will tell you that whoever did accidentally kill him is the little shit, and I hope he never works again. Oh, really? And so oh, for I, some reason... I have reason, heard who it, who it was. For some reason, I just got it in my head that when he said little shit, that it was the guy who owned the pawn shop. No, it was, it was, the, guy, it was the guy who played Fun Boy. Oh, yeah? The blonde, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure that I was wrong. I was pretty sure that I was wrong. But still, every time I see that guy who owned the pawn shop, I'm like, 
Because just seeing him reminds me of Brandon Lee, and you don't see that guy a lot, no. but he is in The Big Lebowski. So it's always like, I'm really into The Big Lebowski, and I love this movie, and then suddenly, once he shows up, suddenly I'm like, <laughs> Brandon Lee died. We need to catch a quick break, and then we could probably wrap it up. Cool, yes. That would put us right. around two hours. Uh, yeah, ish. Sure. <laughs> So we will be back in just a moment. War to talk to us. Pope on film. Like our Facebook page by searching Pope on film. Pope on film! You can follow us on Twitter. At Pope on film. Or email us at Pope at undeadcow.com. Not sure how to listen? Well... Just find us in the iTunes store by searching a dead cow. It's all one word. And you know, if, if you're really hard, hard up, you can always find us on Stitcher. And of course, YouTube at youtube.com slash users slash our dead cow film. I'm going to go throw up into this bowling shoe. I'm going to remember my son's birthday. I am. And I am back. Say it louder. Podcast, are you there? <laughs> yeah, podcast is there, okay? Yay! 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 Yay. <laughs> um, hello. 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 Um, another thing that I love about, about, uh, we're back, right? We're back. Okay. Another thing that I love about the movie The Big Lebowski, it, I, I absolutely love this. I'm pretty sure that this movie has the world's only Black Eagles fan. Uh, yes. Because I, I, I've never particularly liked the Eagles. My wife, huge fan of the Eagles. But I, I've never particularly cared for them, uh-huh. and I always like I, I try and pay attention to race, of course, because I'm a brown man in looks, but not in actual. Like I'm, I'm not that great of a Mexican, so I, <laughs> I ask a lot of the black people that I have known throughout my life. Hey, so are you an Eagles fan? So I've pretty much been asking that to every black person that I'm close friends with since 1998 when this movie came out. Have and you? I have yet to find a black person that really likes the Eagles. Yes. Yes. And, and, but they used them so well because that was a Spanish version of Hotel California. God, that is Jesus that's was wonderful. I got to mention that too. The soundtrack, the fucking soundtrack. I love this fucking soundtrack the mexican version of hotel california i love that um the soundtrack was created by t-bone burnett okay who is a uh, huh i don't know t-bone he doesn't hang out with me yeah he's he's a musician and a songwriter and a music producer and he's released a shit ton of albums and also um he sounds like he'd be a black person, but he is actually a very old white man. Okay. But um, he, I learned that recently because I looked him up on Wikipedia, and I'm like, really? When I think of T-Bone Burnett, I do not think of a skinny old white man. <laughs> I do not think of that. That is interesting. Um, but uh, T-Bone Burnett, they hired him to be the the musical director or whatever. He's the man responsible for deciding on the style of music that the dude would be into. And he really came up with some very strange sort of musical options for the movie. And I wanted to mention something yes. that I'm something that I'm vaguely obsessed with. This is an aside, but it's an important an important aside. Okay. T Bone Burnett wrote a musical with John Mellencamp 
and Stephen King. Awesome. He wrote this recently. It was John Cougar Mellencamp's idea, and I do not care how long it's been. I am still forced to listen to Jack and Diane, so I am not dropping the cougar, you son of a bitch. That's right. You will be John Cougar Mellencamp until the day you cougar die. You mm-hmm. cougar son of a cougar bitch. <laughs> but, I, I support you in that stand. Thank you. Yeah, I totally do. I find it interesting that there are certain types of music that I cannot stop hearing in Oklahoma as opposed to the rest of the world. The, the two, I hear Jack and Diane constantly, a lot of John Cougar Mellencamp. Uh-huh. And, and, um, and I find this interesting in a sociological uh, sense, but Billy Joel. Billy Joel? I hear a lot of Billy Joel, but I think that's because Billy Joel's music very much like Billy Joel is a schlubby everyman. Yeah. And so that's just his music is a very schlubby everyman sort of a relatable working day blue collar yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I hear a lot of him on the radio in stores just nonstop fucking Billy Joel. Really weird. I hear a lot of the piano man. But he's pretty much on the has-been trail, isn't he? Isn't oh, yeah. he just kind of oh, like, yeah. you know, every now and then maybe he'll get together with Rod Stewart or something and play some stuff. Yeah. About it. I, I left him when I left Long Island. <laughs> God In fucking. In fact, when I crossed the border, that's what I was screaming. like, I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> fucking Billy Joel. But it, it, the thing is, is that Stephen King wrote a musical with John Cougar Mellencamp and T-Bone Burnett, and not a lot of people fucking know this. <laughs> Just the general fact that Stephen King wrote a musical, period. Uh-huh. That should be enough for people to get really excited about it. But John Cougar Mellencamp had the original idea for like this horror musical where there are a bunch of different generations. This was his basic idea. There are a bunch of different generations. So each generation will perform a song in their own time period. So the teenager raps, the old person does a blues song and, and so on and so forth. So he teamed up with, uh, Stephen King and he came up with a very Stephen Kingian plot. Okay. It's a it's a southern gothic musical about a uh, two brothers, they're twins, and they always hated each other, and eventually they killed themselves in this cabin. But they had kids, and now the kids hate themselves, so the father, who is now a grandfather, brings them back to the cabin, which is still haunted by the brothers in the hopes of telling them the story of what really happened, in the hopes that the ghosts will find peace at last. Uh-huh. Okay. It's a very Stephen Kingian sort of a plot, you know? Yeah. But it's called The Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. And the interesting thing is, is that a, they weren't sure if they were going to do it as a play and tour it across America, so before they did that, they made a soundtrack, and so the soundtrack features um, uh, a bunch of really famous people. The devil is in the play, and in the soundtrack, it's done by El- Elvis Costello. Really? Okay. Yeah, really weird. Uh, Matthew McConaughey is in it. Uh, Meg Ryan, a bunch of famous people. There's one song in there that that's a really, 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 really good kick-ass haunting song, and it's called Tear This Cabin Down. And it, it, it's a really wonderful song. It's the song that starts, that that plays when the grandfather finally sits them down and talks to them, starts the story. Uh-huh. But a, they released an, a soundtrack slash book. The book has the entire script of the play, 
And the book also has two CDs featuring the entire first and second act of the play acted out by all of these famous people, as well as a DVD documentary about the making of the play. And the book is $50 because it has all these bells and whistles and stuff. Uh And we carried the book for a year before I paid attention to it. (laughs) Because nobody knew that the book came out or that Stephen King wrote a musical or John Cougar Mellencamp was still alive, for shit's sake. (laughs) So one day I'm just putting books away and I'm like, wait a second, where does this go? This goes in the theater section? Wait a second, this was written by John Cougar Mellencamp and Stephen King? Wait a second, Matthew McConaughey? What the hell is this? <laughs> so I had this period in time of like two months, and this was about a year ago, where I was absolutely obsessed with this. So I bought the book, I read the script, I listened to the music, Tear This Cabin Down is still on my phone. It, it's It's an amazing play and so Stephen King and John Cougar Mellencamp and T-Bone Burnett they got some money together and they came up with a touring production of it Gina Gershon starred in it which is weird that Gina Gershon is even still alive enough to star in anything yeah but she toured all they toured all across America with this play and they played everywhere except Oklahoma well, this does sound like a bunch of people who really didn't have much better else to do. Yeah. With the exception of Stephen King. And I, I'm sure he did it because, like, uh, you're going to let me write a mute? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll do that. It'll suck, but I'll do it. Yeah. It, it, Directed it, it, Maximum Overdrive. Fucking maximum. No, his name should be taken off of that movie, and it should say written, produced, and directed by Cocaine. Yes. <laughs> That's how that movie should be changed. And the movie should say in the credits, starring the face of the Green Goblin. Because yes. he is really the star of that movie. The Green Goblin is the star of that movie. It, I would agree. Uh huh. Fucking love that movie. But anyway, it's called The Ghost Brothers of Darkland County, and it's it's worth like hunting down because it's 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 a really weird uh sort of a thing. <laughs> but if you know Stephen King, you already know what the plot is. But the music is pretty damn good. It's pretty it's it's pretty damn good. But I wanted to mention that since T Bone Burnett did picked all the music for this uh for this movie. The interesting thing is is that orig- in movies the person who comes up with the soundtrack right. is is what the musical director I think. Can be. Uh-huh. But he he did not want to be called that. So he changed the name of his part for the script. Here, let me let me let me find the specific the specific part here. Um, there, T Bone Burnett was going to be credited as the musical supervisor, but he changed his credit to music archivist because he hated the notion of being a supervisor. I wouldn't want anyone to think of me as management. <laughs> okay, I can agree. Yeah. And also, you know, there really is no real original music for this, so... That's real. You're crying. What happened? Did you watch the Oogie Loves? You fell? Where did you... Did you fall off the Empire State Building? Like King Kong? You fell off the chair, or did you fall off the hair? Did you fall off the hair? Why were you on hair, Maxwell? (laughs) Well, usually, Maxwell, 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 let me talk to you. Usually, when you hurt yourself, we get mommy to give you booby milk. But mommy isn't here. Um, Why don't you, um... Just go to the store and buy booby milk. No, that won't work. Oh, 
baby. Hey, why don't you tell the podcast about it? What happened, Maxwell? See, the podcast wants to know. The podcast wants to know what happened. No? Bella, you want to talk to the podcast? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Maxwell, Bella wants to talk to the podcast. I was... <laughs> okay, okay. Bella, yes. Come over here and tell the story. Tell the story to the SD slot. That seems to be the place where people talk. <laughs> tell it to the SD slot. Um, I was tickling Maxwell. We were sitting down watching TV. And, um... What were you watching on TV? This is of vital importance. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Tell me. <laughs> Tell me. Thank you, Maxwell. You guys were watching ponies. You guys were watching My Little Pony. I told you it was important. It was important. Was that special? You have in your mouth while you're talking to podcasts? That's very unprofessional, Maxwell. I mean, Bella. I will put it behind my deer, like, ear. You're going to put it behind your deer? Ear. Don't find a deer. Okay. And Maxwell's laughing. Okay, the end. No! <laughs> he Maxwell's fell, laughing. He fell that's, off. That's all that counts. He fell backwards, and he hit his head, and he did a flip. He did a loop-de-loop, and um, I did, I got up. I didn't see him there, and I heard him crying. The end. Okay, good, good, good story. Good story. Um, so we're talking about the soundtrack to The Big Lebowski. <laughs> One of the concepts of T-Bone Burnett was he came up with the idea of musical cues for different characters. Yes. So Sam Elliott, he has Tumbling Tumbleweeds by Sons of the Pioneers. I don't think he exactly invented that. No, he didn't invent that, but he came up with some wonderful cues. Yeah. For the dude, it's Credence. Oh, yeah. And um, he... He really, uh, for Bunny, it's the song uh, Mucha Muchacha. Uh -huh. And that's a song by Esquivel, who is a Mexican dude who does a lot of the music in the movie Four Rooms, which is from another episode of the podcast. And I always like doing shout outs to other episodes of the podcast. Yes. My wife has been obsessed with a TV show on Netflix called Lie to Me. Uh, I've heard of that, yes. Yeah, and it stars the, it stars the dude, uh, Tim Roth, and he plays a real person who, who uses face, facial cues to discover the guiltiness of people, whatever. But it's interesting because... On the show Lie to Me, his ex-wife is played by Jennifer Beals, who was in the second room of Four Rooms. Aha. Uh -huh. So it really is a Four Rooms reunion. I was watching, well, no, I wasn't watching Lie to Me because my wife just decides to watch whatever she wants and I'm in the room with her. Right. But that doesn't mean I'm watching it. But I, it clicked yesterday and I'm like, holy shit, this is a Four Rooms reunion. <laughs> <laughs> they were in the room with Siegfried together. They've worked before. This is a huge breakthrough for me. <laughs> anyway, I like the music Esquivel. For some reason, he, when I worked when I worked at the bookstore in California, we would constantly change the radio station. So sometimes we'd listen to the 80s greatest hits. Sometimes we'd listen to the 50s and 60s station, which was like 50% Beatles. We had good music. We, we really listened to good music. But at my store now, it's pretty much primarily classical music that I couldn't give a crap about. But every once in a while, we'll turn it to the swing station. Okay, yeah. So we've been listening to the swing station a lot lately, which is great because apparently the swing station is 30% Esquivel music. Nice. There you go. Uh -huh. and there's one old guy. There's one old guy who comes in every day and he sits on the comfy chairs and he's walking by and suddenly he looks at me and I'm singing all of the lyrics to Esquivel's Mucha Muchacha. <laughs> Or I'm singing all the lines to uh, Beyond the Sea, 
or Mac the Knife, yeah. or songs like that, Glendora by Perry Como, and he looks at me and he always says the same thing. Now, young man, how do you know this song? <laughs> and I always give him a long-winded answer that he quickly loses interest with. Now, young man, how do you know this song? Well, this is Mucha Muchacha by Esquivel, which is used in the movie The Big Lebowski by the Coen brothers, and in 1998, okay, fine, 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 fine. You've, you've I, never tried saying something like, mm, you know, like, uh, have you ever heard of the internet, old man? <laughs> no, no, no. Oklahoma is 80% old people, so <laughs> they rule everything. I'm impressed with the soundtrack. I love the soundtrack because he really, uh, T-Bone Burnett really did find some strange songs. He really reached for it, yeah. Where even still, it's like, oh, fuck, man, I've, I forgot this is a song. Yeah, I never would have known. I never would have known that Kenny Rogers had a hippie rock phase. Uh huh. Were it not for the movie The Big Lebowski, I right. never would have heard what condition my condition was in. I I most likely heard it at the time, you know, and have completely yeah. forgot about it, and have hardly ever heard it since. Kenny Rogers, I gotta say, Kenny Rogers impresses me because number one he played himself on an episode of reno 911 so already right there he's earned a bit of my begrudging respect yes. but also did you ever eat at one of his chicken restaurants no he had he had one kenny rogers roasters and god damn it he had the best chicken in the world <laughs> he, there was also an episode of uh the the uh, of seinfeld centered around because right outside of uh, Kramer's uh, apartment, they open up a Kenny Rogers Roasters and he starts eating Kenny Rogers Roasters all the time. Even, even better than Kentucky Fried Chicken? Because you've always been a really big Kentucky Fried Chicken fan. I love Kentucky Fried Chicken. I think it's the fact that I never eat Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is why I love it so much. But he, Kenny Rogers Chicken was just so juicy that like you'd eat it and it felt like it was like 50% water <laughs> it would just instantly melt in your mouth and it was fucking amazing I loved Kenny Rogers Roasters and whenever we went to a Kenny Rogers Roasters we would always sing what condition my condition was in but we would change the lines to uh, what condition my chicken was in uh huh okay that ties everything together. That really ties the podcast together. Has has Kenny ever been there? Has he heard it? Does he know? No, because there. It, this was this was a this was a freaking this was a chain. This was all over the place. Huh. There wasn't one Kenny Rogers Roasters. They were all over the place. I I have never seen one or heard of oh, one. They, they they have all closed down now. I believe. I don't think that there are any Kenny Rogers Roasters that still exist. Yeah. But God, I loved Kenny Rogers Roasters. They were fucking wonderful. Another another bit of weird music that he chose was a fairly rare Bob Dylan love song. Which one is that? I I think I missed. That's that. the thing. That's exactly the thing. Because I never, I didn't know that it was Bob Dylan until I bought the soundtrack and just became obsessed with it. But the man in me that plays in the opening bowling montage, that's Bob Dylan. I don't think it sounds like Bob Dylan, given the fact that you can actually hear what he's saying. Yeah, that's always a uh, a very anti-Dylan thing. Yeah, for the last like three decades, he's basically sounded like a musical bee, just going. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, the man in me is a Bob Dylan song, and it's fairly rare for Bob Dylan, and it's essentially a love song. <laughs> I love this soundtrack. Another thing that I have to mention before we wrap it up, okay, is the fact that. This movie has been turned into a religion. Uh, yes, it has. Called Dudism. Seriously, we have talked about this before, okay? Uh -huh. Change your text notifications. <laughs> 
That is the most generic shit. <laughs> oh my god. Like, when I first heard that whistle, I'm like, did my phone reset? No, no, it's just funny. When my text notification goes off, it's always some movie quote or something. When when my friend Allison texts me, it's always, like, something from, like, the Anchorman. Or yeah. the, the Human Torch was denied a bank loan. Or something <laughs> like that. Oh, my God. But... <laughs> <laughs> so dudism, dudism is a religion now and I have to say that the concept of dudism is not surprising because the character of the dude that I think this is a very important character in the history of motion pictures yes. because the dude represents a way of thinking and a very simplistic style of life that I think is admirable and also worth trying to obtain. Now, this is high praise coming from me, a man who created my own religion in 1996 and spent the first five to ten years being fucking ridiculed for it. Yes. Laughed at and attacked. So I'm very filled with emotions when it comes to dealing with another pop culture-based religion. I don't have a lot of patience for people who come out and say, we've created a religion based on the cartoon Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. Right. Which is true. There is a religion based on the cartoon Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. I had a feud for a while with... Um, uh, the with, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shatnertology. Yeah. And I have recently learned that there is still a website up for the Church of Body Modification, and they treated me like shit last decade. <laughs> but it hasn't been updated in about a year, so I'm fairly confident that they aren't the shit that they thought they used to be back in 1998, 1999. Yeah. But... Um, how, how, how long can you swing by your nipples anyway? Good question. Like, those people who were, like, hanging in 1998, they can't have the greatest body now. You know, they, they will, you know, that religion of body modification will lead you to a point of enlightenment, but the enlightenment is like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And that's it. And then you stop <laughs> swinging from the hooks. You hope some of the piercings close up. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck those guys. Like, seriously. <laughs> seriously. God, I hated those people. The interesting thing, which I'm not smart enough to fully explain, but I created this religion to help people out. I was constantly attacked for it. I, I got death threats for Buddhism. Really? I yeah. don't think I've ever heard people that. People really fucking hated the fact that I came up with a religion for Ed Wood. People went fucking nuts over it. And I, I did a lot of press, like 1998, 99, 2000, and the first uh, eight months of 2001. I did a lot of press, and I was all over the place. And almost everybody just treated me like shit. Man, cow. Man Cow's Morning Madness. He yeah. was a shock jock back when that was an actual career decision. And that's not a career anymore. Although I got to give a shout out to my favorite shock jocks, Ira and the Douche, who okay. do a radio show in Pawnee, Indiana. Shout out to those guys. But after 9-11, though, nobody had a problem with Buddhism. Uh huh. Like I did, I did radio interviews and print interviews and a bunch of interviews up until nine eleven, and almost everyone hated me. And then I did a bunch of press after nine eleven, and everyone was fine with it. What do you think made the difference? I have no freaking clue. So I just don't know enough about American society to fully pinpoint it, but it's definitely something. 
And how did you get all that press? I want press. I know exactly how that press happened. I know the exact story, and it's an amazing story, and I love it. So, um, I was doing Woodism. I had the website, and then suddenly, uh, so Ed Wood came out in 94, came out in video in 95. In 1998, it was playing on cable, and the guy who owned the Associated Press watched it on cable, and then he said, and I learned this from a reporter, he apparently said, I wonder what, uh, I wonder what Ed, if there are any websites on Ed Wood, and he just Googled Ed Wood and found the church of Ed Wood and sent a reporter and said, interview this guy. I did the interview in a break room of a bookstore right before, no, during lunch Yeah. in Phoenix. And I, it was a half hour interview and the woman was really super nice and we talked about a lot of things. And then at, at the end, she said, can I leave some contact information for you so that other people who might read this article on the AP wire might get a hold of you? And I said, yes. Assuming that she was going to put my email address or maybe the website. Right. She put my home phone number. Oh, man. So literally, two days later, I got a call at 5 a.m. from a morning radio station in Fargo wanting to talk with the guy who created the Church of Ed Wood. And from that point on, it was just constant calls to my home phone number from people all throughout the world who wanted to talk to me. It was that's, a total, that's pretty absolute. Awesome. Yeah, no, it was amazing. It was amazing. The Fargo people were the only real nice ones. The Fargo people, and then um, the guy who interviewed me from ABC News Radio. Yeah. They were the only nice people. Everybody else was just absolute crap to me. I was just like a funny bit for their uh, morning radio show uh -huh. or their college newspaper or their strange small local newspaper in some small town. But I got a ton of press, and it was weird. <laughs> it was all just a fluke. This one reporter put my home phone number on an AP News article. It was yeah. weird. But after 9-11, suddenly people cool. were... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. It's a wonderful story to tell now, but it was really weird for a while there. I was doing some pretty major interviews, but then it, it didn't matter what major interview I got. It didn't matter that I was on Howard Stern for like two minutes because, oh, my friend is friends with a guy who's friends with a guy who's in the church of body modification. <laughs> and oh, they were just interviewed by Dean Cain, the <laughs> superstar. It did not matter what I did because the Church of Body Modification was just one rung higher. Yeah. Oh, you interviewed by ABC News Radio? Interesting. We were interviewed on the NBC Nightly News just last week. <laughs> you may have seen our interview. I was interviewed by Diane Sawyer just last week. It's like, fuck you guys. <laughs> so hard so weird that I came up with my own religion and somehow I am in a situation with a bunch of other people who created their own religion fuck you guys God. <laughs> so pissed off I'm still pissed off about that I've still got issues what are you thinking about for next week I am not thinking anything about next week. I know exactly what we're doing for next week. I thought you did. Whoa. I do. I do. Hit it. It's the red-headed stepchild of James Bond movies. The one James Bond movie that will be dismissed by a James Bond fan as, oh, oh, that doesn't count. No, it does count. <laughs> it absolutely does count and you just want to not admit that it exists because this is a major huge bizarre 
James Bond film. Yeah. Any James Bond movie that features Woody Allen <laughs> as Jimmy Bond. Oh my God, this is the most amazing movie ever. I love this movie. It is the greatest ending in the history of movies. <laughs> I love this ending. I hate the movie. Because the movie is difficult to get through. But the ending, oh my God, it's, it's a work of art. It is a work of art. I, I love, love this movie. I haven't seen this in like a hundred years. I haven't seen it in about ten years. But I have seen the ending repeatedly because I found the ending on YouTube and I force my kids to sit down and watch it all the time because I love the ending to this movie. Greatest movie ever. And also, I think that Austin Powers was really trying to capture some of this movie. Oh, I'm sure of that. Yeah. But it is the greatest movie ever, and I've been looking for it forever, and it just popped up for free on the internet, and I'll shoot you a link, buddy. Excellent. But it's called Casino Royale, (laughs) and it is literally, they got the entirety of the 60s, and they made a movie of it. And what did we decide on homework? Um, This is the homework. You need to go on YouTube... And type in the following phrase. Go, go, pada presidente. It's Spanish for for president. Go, go, para, P-A-R-A, presidente. And then uh, next week we'll talk about it. Because there's a lot to talk about there. (laughs) There is a lot to talk about there. Yes, uh, there is. Go, go, what is this video from? There's a lot to talk about there. That is the homework. Go, go is the homework. All right. With that, I do need to wrap it up. Yes, me too. Okay. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve. And I want to say thank you. And we'll see you next week. You godless heathens. <laughs>